Welcome to Caciques and Semi-Idols, the web spun by Taino rulers between Hispaniola and Puerto Rico by Jose R. Oliver. Today's read aloud is picking up on section D of chapter 15 on page 130. So let's get right into it. There is no question that the three-pointer is one of the semi-icons that was first objectified from an encounter with the semi-manifestation in nature, as Bonnet's narrative indicated. Whether the stone collars were also manifested and objectified in the same manner as three-pointers is debatable. The three-pointers were subject to veneration and consultation in the Cojoba ceremonies conducted in the temple house. Attached, attaching these three-pointers to an iconographically loaded collar is, in effect, a recomposition of all the icons into a different bounded entity and should be perceived in a different light than if they were to be engaged as separate entities. Obviously, whatever the iconography of the collars meant and whichever personages or beings were depicted in collars and elbow stones, they could only be a part of the meaning and only part of the cast of beings engaged with the cacique who, along with the attached three-pointed personage, was the third entity involved in the relationship. It's not known whether the same collar would always have the same three-pointed semi-idol attached or whether different ones could be selected for different kinds of ceremonial events. It is likely, though, given the greater number of three-pointers relative to collars, that a larger number of the latter would remain detached from the collars for longer periods, housed, consulted, and venerated in the caciques cane. In any case, the symbolic content of a stone collar adds to and modifies the personhood of the three-pointed semi-idol as it provides the latter with yet other images in which to interact. But there is more, because as already noted for the three-pointer three -pointer and collar combination, the images are visually emerging and hiding depending on the perspective of the viewer relative to the position of the collar and its attached three-pointer. Walker argued, quote, I suggest that the meshing of several figures can be interpreted as a mechanism used to link various mythical personalities in a single work, very much like telling a story with different characters or presenting a drama with different actors or agent-patient relationships. This combining meshing is seen as a form of relating myths. Thus, a knowledgeable person can read the myth by observing the figures portrayed, end quote. Furthermore, argues Walker, quote, in Taino slash Chicoid art, there seems to be a deliberate attempt to be ambiguous, end quote, in that in most cases, quote, the artist has intentionally not represented a complete animal or person and only shows one or a few parts without presenting the whole body, end quote, such as the headless fish motif in collars or just head and feet in three-pointed stones. He goes on to argue that this ambiguity is, quote, one way of expressing the omnipotence of the spirit being, end quote. Thus, in this view, quote, gods or semi are powerful because they have the properties of many different earthly lesser beings, end quote. They are, quote, a combination of many different beings, end quote. They are also, quote, from part of many different beings, end quote, and, quote, certain specific parts of many beings specifically relate or refer to a god, end quote, or a semi, such as the fin of a fish, and quote, it is that part that holds the power, end quote. However, the suggestion of visual ambiguity is true from our Western perspective of indivisible persons and the individual individuality of personhood. It would, of course, not be as ambiguous to the natives whose sense of personhood is fundamentally individual and partable even potentially fractal. Note that Walker speaks of parts of or composite beings combining and recombining to create other distinctive beings and relations with yet another being or a three-pointed semi. This visible part always would evoke the invisible hidden parts, hidden part or parts. And rather than just saying that the visible part is what holds power, I would qualify this by stating that the visible cue is what matters to evoke the whole by a process of abduction in the viewer's mind. I regard the all stone and the partly stone collars or elbow stones as having the quality or condition of semi. This does not necessarily mean that these two entities were engaged by or articulated with the cacique during a cojoba ceremony in the same manner as the other semi idols or, or and as and semi as spirits rather discussed earlier, that is to pray, venerate and ask 
or beg them for support and favors under the influence of kohoba. But just like the semis portrayed in dujos, inhaling tubes, and other ritual or ceremonial paraphernalia, they are part of the, quote, equipment, end quote, required by caciques to achieve a state of potency and knowledge during kohoba ceremonies so as to engage the semis as spirits or as hallucinations, visions from our Western perspective. But who are the personages evoked by the stone collars and elbow stones? Are they mythical characters of a remote primordial past, or are they the sorts of non-human potent beings actively engaged with humans here and now? Walker put forth the thesis that there are personages emerging from or relating to mythology in mythical time, and in that sense, they're different from or unlike the 12 semis described by Pané. Let us examine this more closely, and specifically in relation to the stone collars and elbow stones, and for now, deprived of the attached three-pointers. Walker conducted a detailed analysis of the iconography and the designs of a large sample of collars and three-pointers with plausible interpretations about the kinds of personages displayed and ideas evoked by both types of artifacts. He did so with reference to comparative Taino and South American mythology. Walker's detailed, quote, generative grammar, end quote, and modal analysis of the stone collar designs and iconography resulted in the identification of several frequently repeated iconic motifs. Walker's research came up with the following repeated icono iconographic themes. One, the headless fish and the related fish and water, quote, jaguars, end quote, or sharks. Two, frog or men on the face's back. And three, the simple twin and the related double twin bird frog themes, themes that seem to allude to the various myth cycles collected by Pané. The early and dominant iconic form seen in massive stone collars is the headless fish personage. If it's indeed a fish rather than a snake or some other creature, then the personage is depicted, the personage depicted is undoubtedly related to or comes from bodies of water. What little we know about, quote, water beings, end quote, in Taino and religion comes from the myth cycle that has to do with the genesis of Bagua, or ocean, and waters contained in the Oedipus-like myth of Yaya, the, quote, supreme spirit, end quote, or, quote, spirit of spirits, end quote, in Taino religion. In one version of this myth, the defiance of Yayael, or son of Yaya, by returning to his father's house, despite Yaya's having banished him for eternity, resulted in the son's death by the hands of Yaya, who placed his son's bones inside a calabash, or higuero, and hung it from the roof of the house. Later, wishing to see his son, Yaya ordered an unnamed woman, perhaps his wife, to take down the higuero from which Yaya's bones, now transformed into fish, and water poured out. Being hungry, Yaya then proceeded to catch the fish and eat them. This is an act of endocannibalism. The father, or Yaya, quote, ate, end quote, his own son's, Yayael, bones turned into fish and thus food. This myth is not just about the creation of ocean rivers and aquatic life, or fish as food, but it also lays down two cultural rules. One, that sons, competitors of the chief slash father, have to leave the natal home and establish their own house. And two, that upon death, selected bones of the deceased will be consumed by the surviving relatives as a proper or ideal funerary ritual, but in reverse, as the father consumes the son. It indicates that Yaya, the spirit of spirits, is the ultimate seminal agency in the creation of the ocean and rivers and of aquatic life as food sources. It also suggests that the sacrificial death of one's own kin is what it takes to stock and replenish the oceans and rivers with fish or food. The calabash is, of course, a uterine symbol where the bones, or as, as a seminal force, mixed with the, quote, amniotic and, quote, fluid gestated life. Upon overturning the calabash, the amniotic fluid gushed out with fish, thus populating the oceans and rivers. This myth could also allude to native notions implicated in ancestor veneration and of the partability of a person by consuming certain parts of a deceased per person, such as mashed bones of a relative, his or her potent vitality will be passed on to or live on in the next generation. Given the role of Yayael as fish, it's possible that the fish iconography seen in the massive stone collars as well as in the monoliths of the civic ceremonial centers of El, El, Bronque, El Bronce, 
Caguana and Bate del Delfín de Yagüez in Puerto Rico refer or relate to this myth and that the fish personage is either Yayael or those descended from him. As Walker suggests, Yayael's transformed nature or his quote other and quote nature as a fish could be the character that is captivated and sculptured in the headless fish, fish personage in the headless fish personage seen in the massive stone collars. If, however, this icon is more than just a mnemonic device developed, um, sculptured in stone to recall a mythical event and is also a semi-idol, an animate fish person, whose active engagement with the bearer of the stone collar, the cacique, causes things to happen and has effects on future events, then this fish person is a semi in that sense of potency and with the kind of identity and individuality already discussed for the other named semi-idols. I suspect that like other idols, each quote fish semi end quote would have a name, title, and rank and would be fed and venerated. The, the fish persons in the stone collars do not have to be specifically or uniquely a direct reference to or actually be Yayael, but all may ultimately be derived from or generated by Yaya's acts in the primordial past. Thus the fish person semis that are the stone collars worn and deployed by the cacique could each be any of the many fish personages descended from Yayael and ultimately Yaya, who is in effect the supreme being. Each, quote, child, end quote, of Yayael having its own ranking status name like Kohoba idols did. And of course, because of the particular relationship that each stone collar has developed with the cacique or the, quote, owner, end quote, and with the string of heirs of the cacique who will likely inherit it, they will also accrue reputations, legends, and biographies that are distinct from other headless fish stone collars owned by other caciques and their heirs. This view does not require a total disassociation of the headless fish personages seen in the collars from Yayael and the myth related to him, but it allows but it allows for each of the headless fish personages to retain through mythical kinship some quality or part of its ultimate originator and yet simultaneously have its particular identity and personhood. Thus, individuality and partability and the construction and deconstruction of personhood are the critical concepts from appro for approaching the meaning and symbolism of these artifacts. I suggest that the fish semis depicted in stone collars, as well as in the large monoliths framing the plazas of Caguana and El Bronce, are semis who have the powers relating to the stocking and restocking of marine or freshwater resources. In the Cojoba ceremonies, the headless fish collars could be part of the contingent of semis deployed by the cacique in making decisions and policies regarding fishing rights, scheduling of fishing expeditions, the distribution of fish, and so on. In the Hispaniolan myth, it's clear that fishing was regarded as an eminently masculine task that carried high prestige in contrast to cultivating or agriculture. As Walker noted, over time, the fish scale designs of the massive collars lost some of their specificity as, quote, fish, end quote. And as in the slender collars, the upper panel became a more prominent decorative field. Pairing the headless fish semi of the stone collar with, for example, one of the three-pointed stone semis that Jose Juan Aron proposed caused manioc and presumably other crops to mature and grow would mean that the cacique holding the composite object would have control and power over the two key subsistence resources of the natives, crops or carbohydrates and fish or proteins. In both public display and ritual theater, the cacique would be framed by or be one with the two key personages that have agency over the subsistence economy. Sorry about that. If the headless fish personage is paired, for example, with another three-pointed icon whose potency relates to a specific weather phenomenon, such as storms, a different kind of message is evoked as the relationship of the headless fish personage is with another being. Perhaps this would explain why the three pointers were not permanently attached to a given all stone, wood stone, or fiber stone elbow collar. Physical detachment allows for flexibility, permitting the cacique to pair the appropriate three pointed semi to the collar for the appropriate ceremonial occasion. The other repeated theme is exemplified by what Walker labels as the simple twin and double twin personages registered in the decorated registered in the decorated upper panel of slender, st blah, 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 blah. slender stone collars. <laughs> These personages are visible and 
salient when the viewer looks towards the top of the upper panel. The figure that emerges shows the head with eyes, nose, and sometimes a mouth too, and torso of a personage that is placed in an inverse position, torso adjacent to torso, to another identical figure. These are the twin personages whose morphology is very roughly anthropomorphic. Often, though, the pair of opposing twins is doubled with two pairs of opposing twins. When the collar is standing vertical and the viewer focuses on the decorated upper panel, the two opposing twins or the two pairs of twins appear in profile as personages kneeling with feet against the feet of the other twin. The organization of motifs, motifs and icono iconographic designs in terms of simple one versus one Dual oppositions is a canonical rule of art design that can be further elaborated as one versus one versus one versus one. In other words, elements are organized into two opposing sets of pairs to obtain completeness. So four equals one versus one versus one versus one, which equals one or completeness. It was Ahrom who first drew attention to this by pointing out that four is a number that has special significance in Tainoan oral culture. Four months was the length of Yaya's banishment. Four moons was the time it took a real flesh and blood native to complete a journey. Four twin siblings were the total number of culture heroes of mythology. Dual opposites and the derived quadriper quadrip Partite dualism thus express a general principle of structural organization in art and probably in other things as well. The twin pairs of opposed elements require four parts to complete a whole or a unit. When referring to time units, four is what it takes to complete all time, i.e. forever. This notion of double twins as paired opposites in a four-field structure in the decorated upper panel as a requirement for completeness is precisely underscored by the artist's manipulation of the decorated lateral lower panel of slender collars. When viewed laterally, the simple twin personages are hidden from the viewer, and what emerges in the upper register of the panel is a stylized face with a nose often shaped as a triangle or a circle and a pair of eyes. If instead the upper panel has double twins, the lateral view would show a bicephalous image with two pairs of eyes. In both examples, the single or double head of the upper panel is underlain by a panel that shows the features of a single body, arms, legs, feet, and abdomen, or in the case of bats, folded wings. Thus, what in one perspective shows opposing twins or pairs of twins and in total two or four beings dissolves in lateral perspective into one complete being, one body. Four is what it takes to make a complete whole and to indicate timelessness. The theme of unity slash completeness versus partability slash segregation, echoing at once the individuality and individuality of the entities or personages, is thus elegantly and dynamically rendered via, via an atropy in the stone collar. In the example shown here, the lower panel shows typical Tainoan chicken uh, osteonoid conventions for feet and legs as triangles and the abdomen and navel as a circle or oval and a central dot. This interplay between dual quadripartite structures with, an with anatropy now hiding, now displaying two slash four personages or a single individual is meant to emphasize the dynamic multiple natures and individuality of these persons captivated in the stone collars. Because of the feet form and the squatted position of the personages seen in some stone collars and other anthropomorphic icons, such objects have been described as frog-like beings. Three-pointers also have the same kind of leg slash feet forms in the lateral distal prominence depicted, and in the case of full-bodied petroglyphs such as a hakana, the shape of their lower extremities as a whole are even more suggestive of the legs of a frog. Frogs in Tainoan iconography appear to be suggestive of fecundity and fertility, announcing the rainy season. In fact, not fiction, the BBC Bristol team has filmed real coqui frogs Eleutherodactylus raining down from the sky in the cloud forests of El Yunque in Puerto Rico, that is, dropping from the canopy to spawn near the puddles below on the ground.
a feat of nature that captures the very essence of the, quote, fantastic realism, and quote, literary genre of the likes of Alejo Carpentier or Gabriel Garcia Marquez. The rendering of the legs and feet in the otherwise skeletal, anthropomorphic, full-bodied personages, such as seen in Caguana or Hakana, points to the fecundity that all ancestor personages have, that despite their departure from the living, their seminal fecundity is still a paramount condition for the continuation of human life on Earth. In anthropomorphic three-pointed semis, the head, located in one lateral prominence, the face, is where all the signs of power and rank concentrate. Large ear spools, elaborate headdress, even the guaisa plaque or mask may be depicted. The other lateral prominence is often provided with frog-like legs. In the famous Jamaican wood Kohova idol housed at the British Museum, the hands of the person it of the personage are rendered with three fingers and their dactyl cups, a feature typical of several species of frogs, including the coqui. This feature suggests that part of their nature as multinatural beings incorporates the frog quality of fecundity. Who are the four twin personages so frequently seen in the callers? They could be, as Walker argues, a representation of the four twin culture heroes, led by a being named Deminan Caracaracol, of the Macorish or Magua natives, the personages of mythology that provided humanity with key knowledge and artifacts that were lost to them as they became removed further in time and space from their original state in the primordial world in time. It may also be that these twin personages are the constituent and enabling parts that were required to produce a complete whole being. The two or four twin beings are indeed miniature idols, suggestively anthropomorphic in outline, as knee bending or squatting is a posture seen only in anthropomorphic personages, never in zoomorphic beings in Dainoan art. Mythology tells us that two twin pairs are involved in completing culture and humanity with their gifts of culture and knowledge, and that these four personages resolve into a single yet potent individual personage, which appears to allude to frogs. Embedding the four twins into a frog-like body would seem to suggest that this, quote, completed, end quote, personage, seen laterally, is involved in holding and releasing the knowledge and secrets of the supernatural domain handed down by him or them from primordial times. Not surprisingly, conjoined twins also appear in pendants that are typical of Hispaniola. The last theme refers to the later development in collars of a central figure that, to my knowledge, is invariably modeled after a bat. The bat figure is, again, only visibly salient when viewing the collar laterally. It's depicted on the lower decorated panel and as well in the upper panel when viewed laterally. A shorthand version of the latter is also visible laterally in the upper panel. In one stone collar, viewing the upper and lower panels combined, one can appreciate the two elements that form the body of the bat personages, personage, singular, sorry, while the upper half shows the head, eyes, and triangular nose motifs. The lower panel registers the pair of folded wings. On rotating the upper panel of the bat personage, one can appreciate the profile view of the twin personages by isolating it from the rest of the design. In Taino and religion, bats are always associated with the dead and with the non-living souls, or opia, who at night leave their domain to roam the forests. The bat personage, animated by opia, is likely to be just that, the soul of a dead yet animated being, perhaps an ancestor or relative of the cacique who wears the stone collar. The, quote, bicephalous personage, end quote, appears to us Westerners as a fantastic creature. It's held together by a frog-like body and two other slender collars, when viewed laterally. To the single twin slash double twins as bat persons or as bicephalous frog persons rendered in the collar, one must also add the three-pointed semis attached to the undecorated panel. As noted above, there seems to be a choice of any number of three-pointed personages that could be articulated with this stone collar. One might think that three-pointers with the skeletal-like face or heads carved in the central prominence would be a likely choice given the theme of death and souls of the non-living. The so-called Macoris heads, as Walker and others have noted, are frequently portrayed as skeletal or emaciated heads or as heads of bats. The Macoris-type stone heads in many instances retain the base or show a vestigial base of the standard three-pointed stones, but much reduced and obscured by the prominence and volume of the head. 
In some, in some samples, the skeletal stone head also shows bat features, most specifically indicated by the, quote, leaf nose, end quote, motif. These stone heads with vestigial bases suggest that they could also be attached to stone collars. This type of stone head icon may well have developed along with or subsequent to the other three-pointed types. More on these Macorís heads will be discussed in the following section. The point here is that the all stone collars and the derivative elbow stones with fiber or wood ring forms a composite form a composite dynamic set of potent icons that articulate with one another in various ways and whose meanings are salient or hidden depending on perspectives and also in relation to who is the attached three-pointed idol. This again illustrates Eduardo Vivieros de Castro's concept of multinatural perspectivism. One question remains unanswered. Is the composite personage of a stone collar a semi-icon like those discussed earlier, for example, three-pointers or cojoba idols, whom the natives rendered cult and consulted to divine and affect the future? I'm inclined to follow Walker's view that some of the icons and personages represented allude to mythological personages. Example for culture heroes, bats or opias, yayaels, quote, fishy, end quote, descendants but perhaps more specifically to the roles of these personages and not necessarily to a sculptured version of the actual named character characters of the myth, for example, de Minan Caracol. I also agree with Walker that these personages provide the scenario to, quote, read, and quote, both the attached three-pointer and the cacique. The presentation of two or four twins in structural opposition would certainly evoke the culture heroes' roles with their ability to gift even if at a, quote, price, end quote, their knowledge of cultural secrets. And this may well be the central concept of the two or four icons that overlie the central figure, usually the bat personage. One knows that the two or four twins are always there accompanying or being a part of the bat personage, personage or bicephalous frog person, whether the latter is visible or not. And the reverse is also true, whether visible or not, the two or four twin characters always accompany the bat personage. The latter alludes to the world of the non-living, but as a deceased person, it's also the source of the living natives linking the spirit, supernatural domain with the ordinary world. What was early in the sequence, a headless fish personage that had power over the marine or freshwater subsistence, stock had evolved into personages concerned with the culture culture giving or knowledge giving and at once with the world of the dead and ancestors in some sense these are two opposite yet complementary directions of life giving the ancestors are the raison d'etre of the living whereas the four twins make civilized cultured life on earth possible through the release of primordial secrets and to this one must also add the three-pointed semi-idol which we know to have been manifested in nature and then sculptured, and that they had name, status, rank, specific identity, and would be engaged in council meetings for divination. If and when the three-pointer semi is attached to the stone collar, then it seems at least logical to conclude that the entire apparatus is semi. I am much less sure of whether the personages represented in the collar alone are allusions to the other forms of the three-pointed semi, and whether the former, the fish, bat, etc., are just a supporting cast included so as to contextualize the nature of the attached semi and the person wearing the collar. Instead, I think these allude to the multiple authorship and natures of the depicted personage. It is of significance that the abridged and later version of the slender collar, the wood slash fiber and elbow or stone collar, but the face anthropomorphic personage seems to have collapsed the removable and exchangeable face three-pointed stone to one single object, the face and sometimes the entire body, is thus engraved in the panel of the elbow stone. Therefore, this must be a semi-idol as much as it was when it had the detachable three-lobed form. The cacique, when wearing the collar with the semi-three-pointer attached, would hence define and legitimize his person and status as a cacique and be linked with a contingent of potent personages. If I'm right about the view of the bat personages and their articulation with single twin and double twin personages as givers, as agents, the three-pointer that makes rain and the twin personages that gift secrets for civilization, for example, then being displayed by and attached to the cacique makes him quite a potent and powerful personage. Like the twin personages and the bat opia displayed in the collar, 
He has the power to cause, to give, and to take. Section E, the circulation of collars and their inalienability and alienability. According to Walker, these collars were very likely worn by caciques as sashes or bandoliers and, as he noted, taking a cue from Peter Rowe, were publicly displayed, quote, in ritual theater, end quote. There is nothing in the Spanish documentary data to eliminate the likelihood that they could have also been used by the cacique in non-public ceremonies, such as the council meetings, summoning the semis inside the privacy of the cane. The cacique, for example, may have worn the stone collar while explaining to the assembled nitainos or caciques the results of his vision quest into the world of semis. Or, like his dujo, inhaling tubes, canopied semi-idols, and the central idol, the presence of the collar in the cane, whether actually worn or not, formed part of the contingent of potent icons and personages that enabled and joined the cacique to make the hallucinogenic journey. In either context, as public theater or as private ceremony, the collar and three-pointer semi-ensemble defined who the cacique was in a historical sense. Walker suggests that the all-stone and wooden stone collars were corporately owned by the cacique's kindred or clan, although it was the cacique, the one wearing and using it, who was entrusted with it. These objects, as already pointed out, are exceedingly rare. Perhaps at most, a new one was commissioned about every two years or so. The simple arithmetic test performed by Walker on the production of stone collars suggests that there would be a few new ones added for each succeeding generation of caciques, with the implication that most of these would be kept and passed on to the new heir to the office. Although secure archaeological context for stone collars and elbow stones are very few and are mostly fragments discarded at different stages of manufacture, or perhaps broken by use, there is as yet not one single report of any stone collar found, fragmentary or otherwise, that can be associated with human burials. The safest assumption and conclusion is that stone collars were curated. Were these items part of the estate of the cacique or his family? Absolutely. However, whether they could form part of the bequest of the deceased to foreign caciques cannot yet be ascertained. Doing so would, would, blah, blah, blah. Doing so would require very detailed prov provenience analysis of the objects themselves and of the quarry sources from which they were extracted, data that is in many cases impossible to obtain, i.e. the collar's pro provenience is vague or unknown. Given that these collars are clearly symbols of power and authority that make and define the person of the cacique, and given that it is possible that the ensemble, three-pointer plus collar, of icons are potent, Casual agents in conjuring the semis as spirits for consultation, it would seem unlikely that they would be gifted to foreign or allied chiefs. They seem to be inalienable objects possessed by the cacique or his family, and, to use Weiner's phrase, these are, the thing, these are things that must be kept. On the other hand, being potent objects that were necessarily engaged in the exercise of chiefly power, they would also be likely targets to be stolen by enemy caciques. It would seem that it is in the ensemble rather than either object on its own that would make the callers potent items. And like other semi-idols, I would expect that their prestige would be enhanced over their lifetime and always in relation to the human caciques. The older the stone collar and the more generations of great caciques to have held it, the greater its reputation. Although it's still possible that on occasion a stone collar slash three-pointed three-pointer could be gifted in funerary feasts to foreign caciques, my inclination is to think that this would be an exceedingly rare event, considering how few of them were available. Thus, the two possibilities accounting for their geographic distribution are through theft and through inheritance after the, de after the death of a cacique remaining in the local region. Chapter 16, Ancestor Semis and the Semification of the Caciques. Another class of semi-objects -object, that is difficult to determine if they were or were not gifted to foreign caciques or political allies consists of the idols and other receptacles such as baskets and calabashes that contain the actual skull or bones of a deceased cacique. Like these idols made of stone, wood, and other media, these semis were undoubtedly subjected to veneration. They were also imbued with semipotency. Unlike others, however, these ancestor semis did contain real human bones, usually a skull selected from the skeleton at some point after the desiccation of the body. Upon death, the personhood of a cacique would undergo a process of decomposition, literally and figuratively, and deconstruction before being recomposed to emerge as a new person and with a new set of social relations in the afterlife. 
the deceased cacique can, for example, be transformed into a semiified ancestor provided with a new body made of fiber and cotton. This very process of deconstruction and reconstruction or decomposition and death, recomposition, rebirth of the cacique's person in the form of a semi-idol is precisely what is meant by, quote, semiification, end quote. These ancestor semis are not the kind that manifested their presence in nature and revealed their personhood to a shaman. Rather, they're the product of bodily and personhood transformations of the cacique upon death. This, the semi-idol as a semiified ancestor defines the relationships, duties, obligations, modes of social conduct among the surviving living descendants. The living cacique heir and relatives entrusted with such an icon would have direct access to this and all other semiified ancestors by virtue of their direct kinship and descent relations with the set of semiified ancestor idols. The relationships between the semiified ancestor idol and the living relatives are fundamentally different than they were when the ancestor was among the living. The dead cacique is now imbued with semi-power invested with seminal potency and fecundity. The ancestor semi has the potency to promote the production and reproduction of the cacique heir and his lineage, if not the community at large. Such idols and objects of veneration, like the stone, shell, or wood semi-idols that were first manifested in nature, as discussed earlier, would henceforth be consulted and invoked in cojoba ceremonies, offered food, and kept in the cane. Admiral Columbus described several ways in which the body of a dead cacique would be prepared for a funeral. Disemboweling and then slowly desiccating the body with indirect fire lit under the hammock of the deceased would be the first stage. Afterward, the skull, and perhaps other bones too, would be selected and curated while the remaining bones would be buried as secondary interments in a burial ground or, for example, deposited in a cave. Columbus also mentioned setting fire to the house with the cacique's body inside it. Depending on the temperature achieved, the remnant cremated bones would be collected, curated, or buried. In any event, the skull or head was the key part of the human anatomy and the symbolic repository of the dead cacique's potency and power, as is attested by the notorious example of the cotton semi-idol held in the Museum of, of Ethnography of Turin, Italy, whose cotton head wraps the front part of a human skull. As shall be seen, in life the head of a human being was the repository of his living soul, guaisa or guaisa. Thus, upon death, the head of the deceased, revealed after defleshing as a skull, is most likely to be the repository of his soul in the afterlife, the opia or operito. The eyes of the ancestor semi-idols, as well as many other semi-icons, were covered with gold sheets or mother of pearl or other shiny materials, because these are the liminal orifices, windows to the soul, allowing the soul to, quote, see, end quote, the world outside and vice versa for the outside world to reach the inner soul. Two sites with cemeteries, La Caleta and Nisibong, belonging to the Ostionin Ostionoid subseries, i.e. so-called Anadel or transi transitional style or period AD 600 to 900 or 1000, in the Dominican Republic have, ye have each yielded one full-bodied flex primary burial with the skull missing. The headless bodies not only confirm the practice of curating skulls that was noted by Columbus, but also indicate that it was an ancient custom. Michel de Cuneo, who accompanied Columbus on his second voyage while hit in Hispaniola, made one further observation, observation about the process of curation of human skulls. Quote, we heard that when the father of someone falls ill, the son goes to the temple and tells the idol that his father is sick and asks him if he will be cured or not. He remains there until it, the semi-idol, responds yes or no. If it says no, the son returns to the house, cuts the head off of his father, and boils it. I do not think that they ate it, but rather when it turned white, perhaps meaning defleshed, they placed it, the skull, in the temple. This is done only by the senores, or lords. End quote. The curation of ancestors' bones is also reported for eastern Cuba along the eastern coast near modern-day Baracoa. Admiral Columbus recorded in his journals on November 29, 1492, Certain mariners in a house of that village or some other village there found the head of a man. It had to be a skull placed inside a basket and covered by another basket and hung from a post of the house. And it was seen in the same way in another village.
It must be that these skulls were from some principal men of the lineage because those houses were such that they could accommodate in them many people in a single one and that they, the dwellers, had to be speculates, speculates Columbus, relatives descending of the single one, the skull. While in some areas of Cuba and Hispaniola, the curation of ancestors' skulls was done by placing them in higueros, presencia SPP, or baskets, in Hispaniola, some skulls were further modified, i.e. cutting and keeping the frontal skull and mandible, and placed within cotton and fiber figurines. In both cases, the focus is the human skull. In both cases, the skull is wrapped and given a new body or skin, calabash or idol, in both of these, ancestor semis were subject to ancestor cult and veneration. But since in Hispaniola, there were also ethno-historic instances of primary or full-bodied burials of caciques, it follows that not all were cremated and their skulls detached. One would expect regional variations on the specific treatments. A cacique who was not cremated was Bejequio of Jaragua, the most powerful paramount chief in Hispaniola at the time of Spanish contact. Uh, between 1492 to 1496 slash 1497. Thus, having a high status among chiefs is not a sufficient criterion for a cacique to be recomposed as a semi-idol. The reasons for the different post-mortem funerary practices among caciques in Hispaniola are not known. Many variables besides status enter into play when deciding the manner in which the body of the deceased cacique will be treated. For example, the cause and circumstance of death, where it took place, at what time, and what sorts of illness were was respon what sort of illness was responsible, or whether it was from violent death or old age, and so on, will determine the funerary protocol to be followed. In the case of direct primary burials, perhaps the semification of the cacique was accomplished through a different process of transformation and materially expressed in a different manner. Perhaps the large stonehead semis or veritable portraits were such semiified ancestor caciques that were buried in full. The actual skulls are largely hidden from view in the cotton idols or the baskets and dressed up with a new head. Stone heads directly display the head with strong visual hints of a skeletal facial structure. There are other interesting implications of body treatment after death, since it is only a part of the dead cacique, the skull, that would be selected and recomposed as a semi-idol. This means the other parts of the skeletal body, apparently minor bones of the deceased, such as ulna and radius, vertebrae and ribs, were deposited or buried elsewhere. These other parts of the skeleton were buried as bundles in a burial ground, cemetery, or cave. Perhaps different bones of the same person would be further segregated and dispersed among several burial cave sites. For now, it's not yet possible to archaeologically prove that minor bones of the same person were in fact dispersed and deposited into more than one burial cave site. Still, in the karst caves of the region of Utuado, Puerto Rico, I suspect that this was the case. I've entertained the hypothesis that such dispersion into key points in the landscape, namely selected burial cave sites, would be linked to the deceased as a territorial domain. The dispersed bones of the partable individual were laid by descendants as markers for claiming the area covered between such key points of the sacred, sacred geography as, quote, his, end quote, or, quote, hers, end quote. The boundary linked by the caves would mark the lineage's traditional and ancestral territory of origin. Even if the bone parts of a divine, of a individual person were not dispersed and concentrated in a single cave, the fact remains that the singular cave marks the point of origin for the living descendants of that ancestor. If other ancestor bundles of the same family or lineage were buried in other cave sites, it would create a territorial boundary for the descent group. Since the other key parts of the ancestor would also be kept in houses, in cotton semi-idols or baskets, or in burial grounds in or around residential settlement, settlements, such as, for example, demonstrated for the Cocal One site in Puerto Rico, that means that body dismemberment and dispersion function to articulate the living descendants with the various sacred points distributed in the landscapes. These points would identify the origins of the descent group through the landscape. Since in Taino mythology, the first proto-humans emerged from a cave, it makes sense to argue that such localities in the landscape mark the points of origin or birth and the localities where they will return upon death. Translated into a sacred landscape, the bones of ancestors mark the ancestral traditional geographic areas attached to each of the descent groups that comprise a community. By decomposing the partable person of the cacique, 
and dismembering and segregating his skeletal parts, as well as dispersing them throughout the landscape, what is in fact accomplished is the opposite, the bringing together and the integration of the territory of origin and homeland of the descent group. The deconstruction of the ancestor via bone dispersion is what provides integration of the homeland and articulation among the living descendants. This is, of course, a hypothesis that would require much more archaeological testing, especially DNA, and outlays of research funds that are not easy to acquire. In this karst region, so many burial caves have been looted by extraction of bat guano for fertilizer that it's, doubt it's doubtful that a full picture of burial patterns could be obtained, thus discouraging grant agencies agencies from investing in such risky propositions. However, it ought to be tried. The practice of body desegregation and dismemberment after death dovetails with the notion of partable bodies and persons, with the various parts of the cacique's skeletal, in fact, inhabiting multiple locations, baskets, cotton, and semi-idols kept inside houses, in the burial grounds, or near the village, and in one or several caves of the surrounding landscape. One type of ancestor semi-idols that do not contain real skulls is the so-called Makoris type of stone head, which is to a large extent an anthropomorphic portrait. And when a zoomorphic personage is represented, it tends to be a bat person, that is, an avatar of the dead souls. In contrast to the relatively flat guaisas, the stone heads are three-dimensional sculptures. The facial features of the stone heads depict large, round, and deep eye orbits and prominent bony cheeks that suggest skeletal personages. Such skeletal features in stone heads are especially visible, visible in the specimens from Hispaniola and Puerto Rico, shown in figure 3E25. Jose Juan Arrom identified these stone heads and other types of semi-icons as diverse representations of the mythical Maquetauri Guayaba, the, quote, Lord of the, of the non-living, quote, end quote, or, quote, Lord of the absent ones, end quote, that Pané recorded for Hispaniola. This may be so, perhaps, but Arrom's identification is colored by Western notions of art and the assumption of the indivisibility of both persons and art objects or subjects. Arom views these and other semi-icons, for example, in three-pointed semi-stones, guaisa masks, and stone collars, as being literally reproductions of the same mythical individual, or maquetauri, or its avatar, within a Western and contemporary Christian tradition of iconographic interpretation. For example, the many reproductions of an individual personage, such as the Virgin Mary or St. Francis. The examples provided here show facial features that are, by abductive reasoning, the heads of ancestors and repositories of the opia soul, hence imbued with sweet semi-potency. In a broad sense, these are trophy heads. They are still captives, but not through war. They may refer to the mythical Maquetauri Guayaba, as suggested by Arrom, but they may just as likely be the trophy heads of founding ancestors of specific descent groups. The stone head is, like the skull of a cacique, kept in a calabash or within a cotton idol, but where the actual skull is not the required compositional element. The bone is placed by the stone. This is most obvious in the stone head figure 25a. Given that some caciques were also interred in direct primary burials, making the skull inaccessible, it's possible that the cult to these caciques was, quote, agencyed, end quote, through his skull-headed portraiture expressed in a different medium, a solid stone head. In contrast, if the funeral practice required evisceration, desiccation, body dismemberment, and skull selection, then the alternative process of semification would result in skulls being available for incorporation in the baskets or idols. Either as stone head, a skull in a calabash, or inside an idol, it seems that at least part of the deceased cacique's personhood was retained or kept among the living, and thus had a direct engagement with and a physical presence amongst his heirs and descendants. It's worth stressing the significance of physical presence of not just ancestor, but of all semi-idols. Recall that the Kohoba ceremony taking place in the Kane house, or temple, to summon and engage the potent semis, always involve the physical proximity between the idols and the cacique or shaman. If the invocation was for an ancestor semi, then the physical proximity to the ancestor semi-idol would be likewise necessary for the proceedings to go ahead. One might wonder why someone would bother sculpturing a stone skull or a head when the real thing would seem to provide a much more direct link to the ancestor 
even if it remained hidden within an idol or calabash. The substitution may be for various reasons. For instance, if the original skull of the semiified cacique had severely deteriorated over several generations, then one way to preserve its iconic integrity would be to totally recompose it as a stone head. It could also be that some of these stone heads represented a remote apical ancestor whose precise genealog genealogical ties to living descendants had been lost in the mists of history. It may be that the funerary protocol to be followed, given the appropriate circumstance of death, required a primary interment of the full body. Therefore, his or her descendants maintained physical proximity to their ancestors' potency by, quote, capturing, end quote, his or her opia in a stone head. Certainly, stone has the advantage of permanency over bone. But not all stone-headed, not all stone head semis were necessarily kept among the living forever. There's at least one case where, quote, a lithic Makoris type face that represented the face of the dead cacique, end quote, was found accompanying a full-bodied primary burial site at La Cucama Cemetery. It is the same burial already discussed earlier in connection to the rarity of burials indicated, indicative of a high-status individual. If the looter's description is correct, then there must have been specific circumstances when a stone head would be retired from circulation and buried, possibly with, its, with his descendant. The placement of an ancestral human skull next to a full-bodied interment has deeper historical roots in the Caribbean. From a Lenin or Osteonin, Osteonoid, circa AD 900 to 1200 context as the Paso del Indio site, archaeologists have found three clear instances of a second adult male human skull placed with a complete adult male primary burial. This skull would be either held by or cradled in the arms of the three deceased, two male adults and one subadult. Interestingly, no instances of females holding detached skulls were found at Paso del Indio. Finally, the craniums accompanying these full-bodied primary interments were determined by bioarchaeologist bio Edwin Crespo to, quote, have been already secos or dry when interred, end quote. There is thus a parallel between the earlier Paso del Niño and La Cucama, where a, a trophy head, skull or stone, accompanied the buried individual. Walker raises the question of whether the skull was of an enemy or a kin of the deceased and suggests, quote, solely on the basis of the positioning of the secondary skulls in the hands or arms of the primary individuals, I'm willing to venture that these three pairs of burials are evidence of ancestor worship. The primary were positioned holding or cradling skulls close to their bodies as if they were treasured and dear, not what I would expect to see when a man was buried with a trophy head of a mortal enemy, end quote. Like Walker, and in agreement with Crespo, I'm inclined to think that these skulls at Paso del Indio, as well as the symbolic scone, skull as stone head, as a proxy at La, Cacu, La Cacam, Cucama, coño no me sale, La Cucama, are related by kinship to the deceased. I also agree with both author, authors that the final proof rests on the results of genetic proximity between the primary individuals and the secondary skulls the results of which are not yet available. However, I disagree with Crespo's arguments that curated skulls at Paso del Indio are not related to a trophy head cult. The skeletal stone heads at La Cucama were not considered in Crespo's dissertation, although he noted the skeletal as well as the intentional cranial deformation features of Macoris type stone heads. It may well be that Crespo defines quote, trophy, end quote, head in a more limited sense as war captives or enemies' heads than I do. Enemy trophy heads or skulls would perhaps have been treated more like the perforated human frontal bone pectorals, drilled teeth, and some of the hollow ceramic effigy heads around, I mean, found in Puerto Rico. I agree with much of what Peter Rowe considers to be enemy trophy heads as opposed to those of ancestors. However, I disagree that guaisas or flat face masks with drilled holes around the periphery are, quote, enemy, end quote, trophy heads. The term guaisa means, quote, soul of the living, end quote. And thus I find it unlikely that these represent the trophy heads of enemies unless one can prove that a guaisa specimen itself was taken as a trophy. The semiified stone head idols or skulls and calabashes of caciques have direct links of descent 
with the living cacique and his kindred and, of course, define how the living relate or not to one another. These ancestor semis, like all other semi-idols, have names and titles, ranks and status and genealogy. They will also be subject to inheritance by descending generations of caciques of his lineage, although it's clear that under some circumstances these idols will also be interred along with their descendants. The circumstances under which some or most will be kept in the house or cane and others buried with a relative at some point in time are not known. Nonetheless, the curated semiified ancestor idols or skulls are the ones about whom Aretos will chant in remembrance of the great deeds that the cacique accomplished in life and to whom new deeds will be added henceforth in the afterlife. These would also be likely to be involved in the cohoba induced consultations when important decisions have to be made. Perhaps these ancestor idols would be the focus of ritual when the issues at stake have to do with bridge giving, pregnancy, and marriage, and in short, things to do with the well-being and future of the lineage members. If these ancestors, semi-idols, uh, embodied the lineage as fractal individual persons, it would seem to me that they would rarely, if ever, be involved in bequests or gifted to foreign caciques, to groups outside the descent line. On the other hand, if aretos could be gifted, as attested by the cacique Guarionesh's case, then so too could these apparently inalienable, quote, possessions, end quote. After all, the areto is in many ways the rhetorical or speech and dramatic or theater realization of what the ancestor idols as materials elicit, the heroic epic history of the living, as well as the ancestor caciques who ruled the cacicazo. So we're going to go ahead and stop here at chapter 17 and pick up with uh, the Guaisa face masks, gifts of the living for the living in the next video.